Come on, show me the magic. Can I take you out to the picture? Well, I hope you'll come and see me in the movies. What a scene of your Hollywood song. Hello, and welcome back to the Beatles Films Podcast. I'm Matt Looker. I'm Ed Williamson. We're both professional film writers and Fab Four fans, and we're back for another season, each week discussing a different movie about, starring, or inspired by the Beatles. And to celebrate making it to season three, we're kicking off this new run of episodes with the one film I couldn't wait to cover since all the way back from when we first conceived the idea of the podcast. That's right, it's finally time to discuss 1984's Give My Regards to Broad Street, a musical drama written by, scored by, produced by, and starring Paul McCartney. Um, so a bit of context for this film and why I'm so giddy with excitement and why I can't wait to dig into it uh, is that while the soundtrack to the movie topped the UK album charts at the time of release and it produced a single uh, No More Lonely Nights that was nominated for both a Golden Globe and a BAFTA, the film itself is universally panned. It was such a critical and commercial flop that uh, who's to say whether or not actually it directly led to just two years later, Broad Street Station itself closed down. <laughs> the first question to ask, or the first thing to sort of really dig into is, what is it about this film that doesn't quite work? And I think that the obvious thing to point out is, not much plot. Yeah. Really not much plot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the, entire, the entire premise of the film is, Paul McCartney, playing basically Paul McCartney, uh, has the master tapes for his new album go missing, And they were last seen with an employee of his who has a sketchy criminal past. Uh, And that's it. That's it. There's no there's no sort of really tracking down of the tapes. There's just Paul McCartney playing some songs and being left to wonder and imagine and daydream and fantasize about what may have happened to those tapes. (laughs) That's right. Is that fair to say? Yeah, it's it's an odd thing to do. Uh, like as an auteur piece, <laughs> okay. which, which I, right. mean, but, I mean, going straight into that, are we? <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, but but like fair enough. Like by definition, this is an auteur piece. You sure? Uh, <laughs> but 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 think about um, it's a strange thing to do to want to write and star in in your own film that is kind of all about you. You would think it would be more of a sort of hero fantasy, you know. It mm. suggests a certain ego or a certain self-aggrandizement, and obviously, I don't think Paul is is free of those things by any stretch. But what a strange thing to do to write a film in which you are the center of it, um, but everything just sort of goes on around you, you know. Yeah. You're, you're yeah. Not, you, you don't particularly initiate anything happening. Like you, you're all. told that there's a big problem, and the people who work for you say, "Well, this is a really big deal. We need to fix this," and you go. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'll just be in the studio. Let me know what happens. I mean, and, and so this is this. That's that's really it because right. because uh, the, the first of all, there are no stakes as far as Paul's concerned in the movie. Right. He, at no point does he seem particularly overly worried about his tapes going going missing no. uh, at any point. And otherwise, we're just experiencing what is supposed to be a typical day in the life of Paul McCartney. Yeah. Uh, as by the way, uh, within the first five minutes literally scheduled out and laid out by his 80s car robot yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 9 30 meeting yeah. you no know, um studio time rehearsal interview uh it basically gives us the the, the car robot gives us a um a breakdown of all the movie beats that are coming up yeah yeah um but at no point during any of that does he feel any sense of urgency to track down these tapes? <laughs> no. He's just carrying on about his day and just kind of gently wondering what happened to them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he doesn't seem to mind too much, does no. he? <laughs> and also, it's very easy to, to think of this as as a big ego piece. And it is, you know, far from free of ego. But at the <laughs> same time, it, it's, it, it seems like so hubristic. And obviously the, uh, the, way, the way that it turned out you know, is sort of famously critically panned and seems to have... The critical reception of it seems to have stung him enough that he just sort of, like, it, it hid away a bit for the rest of the 80s. You know, mm. he didn't really, you know, he didn't tour again until the Flowers in the Dirt tour. I wonder if it reminded him a bit of Magical Mystery Tour, uh, you know, that, that, that first kind of... Uh, uh, critical panning, in which he was quite defensive. Like, you know, we, we discussed Magical Mystery Tour and he went on TV to talk to David Frost a day or two later. 
um, and was defending it, you know, mm. on, on the basis of no, I think you know these are valid artistic choices. Um, and the sort of the the accompanying South Bank show in which Melvin Bragg is interviewing Paul in 1984, um, which people should seek out on YouTube because it's fascinating. It is amazing. Yeah, um, Melvin Bragg is actually challenging him a little bit uh, about some of his creative choices, you know, and it's it, it you know, he's kind of slightly defensive about that as well. But it's but it's interesting that like the last time he had creative freedom over a film which he largely did with magical mystery tour mm. i know it wasn't uh, you know he was sort of more the director of it than any of the other beatles well he wrote the script as well the script <laughs> he, yes <laughs> he wrote the circle he wrote the circle yeah um uh like it, it it was kind of critically panned but i think he was quite pleased with the results so it's interesting that he uh, this project uh the stakes are, are probably a bit higher and he seems to go into it with a very similar attitude. He treats it quite casually, as as we understand it. The script he turned in for it was twenty two pages long. Um, the movie script is really large font. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, movie scripts in general. Uh, the general rule of thumb is that there'll be a sort of one page per minute. So you know, ninety ninety minute film, ninety page script. So twenty two minutes, and I think there was quite a lot of bits where he'd filled in, just going, oh, and then and then you know, to get from here to here, we'll just sort of make bits up, or like you know, song here or yeah. something. Music. Like that. Uh, he what he says in the South Bank show uh, is that he had music one to ten, and he'd say music one here, music to here, yeah. which says to me two things. Um, it says that. Um, he wasn't choosing music or or designing the film for the music to actually relay anything that was relevant to the plot at the time. No, but also, as evident in the film later on, uh, when when you see it, um, none of those musical choices actually drive the plot forward at all. Like no. the film comes to an absolute standstill every single time they start playing yeah. a song, and sometimes. Those are two or three songs in a row. <laughs> so they were just yeah. ten to, a segment of 10 to 15 minutes where there isn't any plot and you're just watching him perform songs. Yeah. yeah. Which arguably isn't a bad thing, but also no, but... isn't necessarily conducive to a uh, compelling drama. <laughs> no, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the sort of artistic choices he's made are very much those of a man who's just completely confident that anything he does will be great and mm. and that the, the the normal rules of of how to do things don't apply to him even when he's stepping into a medium in which he's not expert he, he can be forgiven for being completely confident in that like when when i'm writing and recording music but my choices are good ones you know mm. even if other people aren't quite so sure i'll be like no no i know what i'm doing generally speaking he will be proved right but he seems to take the same approach into film in which he doesn't have a track record. Uh, I, I think that's kind of where the hubris is because the idea of, even though it's his own production company, you know, so this is MPL going in, uh, you know, sort of fi financing the film to the tune, tune of half a million. And it is initially going to be a sort of one hour TV movie. Mm -hmm. um, and they get a TV uh, director in called Peter TV Webb. TV commercial director. TV commercial director in. Uh, so yeah, I think I feel like that's an, an important point to make. <laughs> yeah, yeah, TV yeah. commercial director who, and again, probably another important point to make, never made another film after this one. No, that is true. Um, yeah, that uh, that may well be significant. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so they get the the uh, TV commercial director uh, Peter Webb, who is well suited to uh, a t the sort of TV project that it starts out being. Mm. And it's sort of more acceptable, I suppose, the fact that he has to work in a very informal, uh, ramshackle, shoestring kind of a way with this sort of non-script that Paul has turned in. Like, it hasn't gone through any sort of rewrites or any edits. It's, you know, he's, it, 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 all the holes in it are ones that the director is kind of expected to fill. And that's one thing when you're working on a one-hour TV project. Um, what happens then is that um, the it it gets it ends up with uh, Harvey Weinstein, who uh, is the head of uh, Miramax, who then takes it to Twentieth Century Fox, who then puts in I think about four million pounds worth of budget, and because they think this is going to be a sort of you know this is twenty years after a hard day's night they're probably thinking it, like Ringo's in it as well this is a Beatle reunion you know mm. we can we can sell this they haven't seen the script or anything like that 
uh, they just go for it. And so all of a sudden it becomes a very different thing. And so I, I suppose it's when you're more or less self-financing something, you can imagine the original version of this as originally envisaged as a TV thing with a half a million pound budget. It, 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 not the worst thing in the world to approach that a bit like you did Magical Mystery Tour. Sure. But then when it becomes something else, maybe you need to start taking it a bit more seriously. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. May, maybe get someone to have a look at the script. Yes, you know? yeah, yeah. What little of it there is. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I love the idea that the, the full script that he wrote for this was, was 22 pages long. I, I kind of, I feel like a lot of people say, I've written a film script. And what they mean is they've got an idea for a film script, but mm. they haven't actually just got around to committing pen to paper yet. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there's a reason why they haven't done that, because actually their idea for a film script is no more than an actual a premise. And the problem with actually writing the script is you have to think about things like subplots mm. and character development, yeah. uh, none of which is present in this film. So I kind of feel like Paul has done the thing of saying, I've, I, I've written a film script and and has just stuck to the bare basic bones of what that idea is and not really developed it any anywhere beyond that initial thought yeah. into a full script. Yeah. Um to the extent that when he in that South Bank show, um, he talks about how, you know, he he wants to be involved in films, he was looking at scripts um that might interest him. And then one day he was stuck in a traffic jam and decided that he was just gonna start writing. Yeah. And what I love about that is the film starts with him stuck in a traffic jam writing. Yep. So you can just imagine that he's in a traffic jam writing. And it's like, what should I write about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, let's write what you know. But if you see, that's the interesting thing. It's not, it, you know, it's not just, it's easy to look at and think, well, this is this is a big star and nobody said no to him. And, like, you know, and this is what happens when like big stars have like, uh, bad ideas or even good ideas that just need finessing but they don't listen to anyone else and everyone says yes to them you know it's tempting to think that's the case but it, it doesn't seem to be because also like in 1984 paul mccartney is not the biggest star in the world mm. you know it's not it, and like it, it's the the fact that miramax came over you know and sort and and fox came and pumped a load of money into it um in fairness to him, it's not particularly his fault. It seems. Yeah, yeah it sure. just seems to have like uh, you, you know gone that way, and uh, and the whole thing like became something quite different. Um, but yeah, I, I think um, the the whole thing of like him sitting in the back of the car, which is a framing device for the whole film. Yep. Can we get into talking about the story? I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah. I feel like we'd already covered it, haven't you? Know, done <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Okay, let's dig into those few words a bit more. So, I, I, I was. So, what happens at the start is uh, Paul is sitting in the back of a chauffeur-driven car. Um, the to introduce him, the camera pans up from his his boat shoe. Um, because, and I like the fact that the camera like lingers on his boat shoe a little bit before panning up his leg to show, oh, this is Paul McCartney. But I like the fact that it's the way that you, that you film, you introduce a character to say, oh, this is a man of wealth and taste. <laughs> he has boat shoes and everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he's there. And so he is sort of writing on a pad. He seems to be writing lyrics uh, mm. to something. And then he sort of... Um, he sort of like uh, taps his pen in the air as if he's had an idea, and uh, uh, on the radio, it's the DJ says something like, um, uh, "Going back to the the, the summer of 1966." Yeah, it's, it's, it's raining outside. So it's pouring down with rain outside, yeah. and he's just saying, "Like, take you back to the sunny days of 1966." That's it. Yeah, and they play "Good Day Sunshine." Yep. Which is the re-recorded version? It sounds very, very similar to the original. Yeah, like indis- indistinguishable. I think. Yeah, yeah, um, and that makes him drift off into a reverie, a sort of day- daydream. Um, and the the daydream is initially that he is driving a very fast car, and he's got his, uh, as you say, the uh, computer that tells him, you know, like the ZX Spectrum, basically, that yep. tells him, you know, what his day is going to be. So the interesting thing about this, as a conceit, is that. It is Paul McCartney daydreaming about having a more exciting life than being Paul McCartney. Right? <laughs> yeah. so, but it but it introduces the idea um that there are bits about being Paul McCartney that are quite mundane, you know, like yeah. like sitting in a chauffeur driven limo <laughs> writing in your pad. But also what what happened because um uh then later on 
at the end because the, the entire rest of the story other than the last two minutes or so um are uh, turn out to be what he's been daydreaming yes um the the ending is sort of often criticized for being a um oh and it was all a dream ending uh but in fairness to him and like this is one of the few things i would defend about this i'm listening uh he he has flagged that right from the start um yeah but and yes and I see what you mean. but the, there there are a few there are a few possible approaches the creative approaches that he's taken to this framing device, all of which are quite interesting, I think. Right. So, he, so is it that uh, he he wants you to forget that uh, that he is daydreaming? The, uh, Paul McCartney, the writer of the film, mm-hmm. wants you to forget that Paul McCartney, the character, is having a daydream, so that later on it is a satisfying reveal that this was all a dream. Because yes. because you, you saw so little of it at the start that you've forgotten it. I'm going to say yes. Okay, but let's hear your other options. Or is it is it not supposed to be a twist? Like, does he want you to know that he's dreaming it all the way through, and he thinks that that, that this has satisfactorily achieved that aim? So my I I, I would if I were to give uh, Paul McCartney, the screenwriter of this film, uh, credit that I don't necessarily think is due right no okay <laughs> i would say that um it, it's a it's a very good thing that the very first instance of paul mccartney's daydream is an obvious daydream where mm. he is uh like basically racing a car yeah. uh, along a country path and it's all sped up and it looks like a fantasy so it's very yeah, clearly it's earmarked as a yes right, exactly very right. cartoonish yeah so when that part of it ends you would, as an audience, you are forgiven for thinking you are back to reality now, mm. and it's and then the ending where it's revealed that it's all been a daydream is actually still a twist because you have been fooled into thinking that it was only that first part that's a twist. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. I don't know whether Paul McCartney, the screenwriter of this film, uh, has approached his twenty-two page script <laughs> <laughs> with with that deceit in mind. No, right, yeah, no. It, it's fair to say he hasn't approached it with that much rigor. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, but then sort of at, at the end, uh, when he sort of wakes up and says, "Oh, he, he's been daydreaming," it, so he's interrupted um, by his his manager Steve, uh, Australian, played by Brian Brown, um, and uh, and Steve reveals that the character Harry, who has been the the sort of part, the sort of main, main driver, if you like, of the daydream narrative, mm. is is an actual person that exists in. In, in the life of this Paul McCartney. Yes. So he, so it's not that he has dreamed a thing where there's this imaginary guy who works for him. No. Who, who everyone thinks has uh, stolen the tapes, but Paul is convinced hasn't. It's, it's not that he's made up that bit. Uh, it's that there is a guy who works for him in real life. Yeah. And he's made up a story in which that guy is accused of uh, stealing things. And Paul, because he's really nice. Yeah. Uh, is the only one who defends him because yes. and like the the character of Paul uh, is well uh, <laughs> he's very very keen to point out and it happens a lot throughout the story um, where he's saying no no Harry, Harry's a good guy I just yeah, don't yeah. think he'd do this yeah exactly yeah. I believe him I, yeah, you know, right exactly yeah, yeah. and he's Every- like we we've in a space of a day we've uh, judged him we've found him guilty and we yeah. sentenced him right right it's like I, which I I don't think we've got they, at the point he says that it's like. I think we. I think you've just judged him. I don't know the other two, but <laughs> right, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, don't, yeah I, don't, I don't think you really understand the British legal <laughs> system. Paul, <to laughs> no, be honest, at all. Like, yeah. you know. <laughs> well, when has he ever had to? <laughs> no, true. Um, uh, but it's interesting you say that because I I agree. So when at the point at which Brian Brown's character Steve says, um, "Yeah, Harry's here. Like he's all fine," in my mind, I'm thinking, how close does the real life Harry in that part of the story? resemble the daydream harry mm. like does he does the real life harry have a criminal background right in which case you could argue that paul's daydream is about his own paranoia um and uh bias mm. around having hired someone with, with that and, and the fears that that might bring with bringing someone like that into his like sort of personal fold yeah um or he doesn't 
And Paul McCartney just thinks he's a bit shifty. So then daydreams this entire <laughs> criminal past <laughs> and conjures up quite a detailed backstory. <laughs> yeah, with, with, with like Tracy Ullman as the guy's girlfriend yes. and everything, who's yeah. always hanging around looking glum. Yeah. And Paul just like inex- inexplicably takes her for a drive in a van. And then there's like a... There's like a there's a car chase which sort of goes nowhere, yeah. and so like they're being chased in this van, and it it ends with them just parking the van. The people who were chasing them just stopping behind them, yeah. And that's that. That's it. Yeah. Like the, you know, it's not like they were trying to kill them or anything. It's just that. And then it, and then he's, and then I think he like uh, says to Tracy Ullman like, um, oh, okay, I've just got to go to rehearsal now. I'll see you later. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. It's what. <laughs> where where is any of this come? Where, where did you think this was going? Like, but it's, but the interesting thing is actually in in the writing of it, there is what is so conspicuous to me is there are so many dead ends, um, but also just just so much dead space. Yeah, in the scenes, so there are bits where he and a couple of people who work for him are sort of going to a rehearsal room or a meeting room or something like that. And they just sort of walk down the corridor and they get in a lift and there's a sort of 15 seconds or so of the door opening and then pressing the button like before anyone speaks. And then they sort of walk, you know, they get out and they're sort of walking down the corridor and like none of this has been filled with dialogue no, or, yeah. or, or like no one's saying anything that pushes the story forward. In lots of cases, no one's saying anything at all. But like, have, have you written it that way? Yeah. Or like, you know. So I, I, would, I would assume not. Um, no. Because, I mean, I would be stunned if 22 pages of script included detailed descriptions. Because <laughs> what else was, you know, what what else is he uh, including there? Yeah. Um, you're right. There are there are moments like even when they when he finishes recording in the studio, there are shots of someone's hand pressing stop on the control panel mm. and the reels yeah. like spinning around and stuff. Uh, and I even noticed there's um there's one occasion it really stuck out for me. It was, I think, Paul, I think he might be talking to Ringo at the time, but he basically is asked a question um, and the camera cuts to Paul to show him give a quick shrug. Right, yeah. And yeah, then yeah. cuts back to the person again. It's like, <laughs> yeah. that's the kind of, that just doesn't, that yeah. kind of editing yeah. decision doesn't happen in films, yeah. right? Like, that's, no. it's, it's, if you don't have an answer, it's implied by your lack of a response. Yeah. And, uh, and, and going back to um, Harry and the character of Harry. And his sketchy criminal past, real or not, I think. There's a real contradiction uh, around how close is Paul in this film to the real-life Paul McCartney outside of this film? Like, is he actually playing himself? Yeah. Because I think the the level of fame is implied but not shown. Because you have these moments in the film where he has these grand song sequence set pieces. mm and and in particular, it's absolutely incredible, futuristic sci-fi space glam rock um, setup for the song "Silly Love Songs," yeah, which is insane to me. Yeah. Which yeah. features a body popping dancer who at one point does a double flip backward somersault mm. as cartoon lightning shoots out of his boots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> very bizarre. But at the same time, you have Paul outside of those moments, apparently hiring his own runner by himself in a pub, knowing that that person has a criminal background. Yeah. Because he is, and I think Paul is very, very keen to stress this throughout the film, he's a man of the people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's very much in touch with the the working class, yeah, the yeah, criminal yeah. classes. Yeah. Um, he just understands them better than the, the corporate bigwigs that he has to deal with in his celebrity life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, he's very keen to stress that, isn't he? Um, uh, to the extent that I still don't understand what his relationship is supposed to be with giant haystacks. No. <laughs> when he turns up in the film, when he when he turns up in the film, it's it's a, a re, it's initially a fantasy that he has where he envisions Harry trying to sell giant haystacks the master tapes. Yeah. Giant this is giant haystacks obviously the 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 eighties wrestler. Yes. Yeah. Um who in this film plays just a very extremely heavy set criminal man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and quite well as well, by the way. He's quite good, John Hayes. Yeah, he's quite good. Yeah, he's yeah, quite yeah. funny. Yeah. Yeah. 
so he he has this fantasy where he envisions Harry selling him the master tapes, um, and the fantasy is so strong that he actually stops the song that they're playing because he says out loud in the microphone, "No, don't." Or, or stop or something like that because he's overcome with this the feeling of, of the vision he has of Harry doing this but then immediately he just sidles up to Giant Haystacks and starts saying so have you seen Harry these days and and this, and he's like oh which one Harry in the golden horn or whatever it is or Harry Krishna right. he's like no yeah. Harry Torrington the guy who works for me mm. and Giant Haystacks oh that guy it's like how do you know each other? How do you know each other? <laughs> like, if you, if it, does he, does Giant Haystacks have a criminal background to this? Like, it's just, it just the mind boggles as to what that character is supposed to represent, <laughs> what his relationship with Paul is, how he might know Harry. What it, it just, it's in, it's just a, a weird moment of characterization that appears out of nowhere and just disappears again without a, well, I say disappears again without any sort of like signal, but it actually, his entire moment in the film ends with him holding up someone by the scruff of his neck mm. off the ground whilst loudly growling yeah until yeah. the camera cuts away from him yeah yeah i think yeah that's is that the last we see of giant that Hester? is i think that's the last we see of him yeah yeah that question of um is paul playing himself or not mm. you know or is he playing a fantasy version of himself and like if you are paul mccartney what is your fantasy of what you are like look like yes when, yeah. when your life is is most people's fantasy life yeah you know, it, it, it's it's a really odd thing so you, you can see little bits in it where <laughs> where uh, there's a bit where he's just like w- walking out of his rehearsal like they're having a break and um this album where the master tapes have gone missing his his manager steve comes in and says um oh the um advance orders for the album have topped five million that, and so I, I looked it up, and that would make it like the fastest selling like <laughs> that album in terms of like pre sales uh, of all time by a factor of about four. Right. So at this point, um, so to give it some context, um, Beatles for Sale had seven hundred and fifty thousand pre orders. It, it was then overtaken by Super Trooper by ABBA with a million. Then Welcome to the Pleasure Dome, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, one point one million. Then later on, uh, Be Here Now had like more or less 1.5 million. So, wow, okay. So by this po- at this point, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, I suppose, 1.1 million would have been, that's the most pre-sales anyone's had. And in Paul's mind, but which by the way, he will know these figures. Yes, no, absolutely it, it, he it's will. Not yeah, like he's, he's very commercially minded. Yeah, right, and, at this and, point, it's, yeah. and it's not like he's, um, it, it, when he writes that, he, is, he must be aware that, <laughs> that, uh, that this, this fantasy version of him is being told, oh yeah, you're um, this album uh, for which we've lost the tapes and you don't seem too bothered about it. Yeah, it has like smashed, uh, you know, and and it, and even just recontextualized <laughs> what, what what it is, so, it, what pre sales even are. You know, this yeah. this, this is this is absurd, <laughs> and and he just goes, all oh, right, yeah, well, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. So that so that is the fantasy that Paul McCartney has about what he the person he would like to be, like in his dreams, yeah. he'd like to be the person who does that because it's not enough, right, to be the Paul McCartney he already is. Yeah, yeah but but also, but the contradiction in it is is that the life. He, he he the character leads in it is is a relatively unstarry one. Yeah, like he has a lot of. You, you know, he, he has a lot of sort of money and stuff. You can see that he can afford sort of nice cars and things like that. And he's being sort of chauffeur driven and whatnot. But generally speaking, this seems to be his fantasy version of himself where like, I, I sell even more records than I do now. <laughs> um, but I'm still a normal guy, even yeah. more of a normal guy than I actually am in real life, maybe. Yeah. You know, because he does do things like turns up at the the pub where Harry was last seen, just sort of drives himself there, goes to this pub, goes upstairs to where the landlord lives, you know. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, which the pub, which, by the way, is called The Old Justice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's just one of those distracting things yeah, where you think, yeah. pubs uh, aren't called no, that. No. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, sorry, go on. <laughs> no, it's... Uh, just, uh, <laughs> just where else do you go? That, yeah. yeah, that's a really good point. The, uh, the I, I love the idea of, like... It's like saying I, I I'm I'm rich uh, beyond your wildest dreams. I have two billion dollars in the bank. 
what's your greatest dream to have 2.4 billion dollars you know? <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> and a car with flames up the side <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> One thing I did want to touch on was, um, hey, Ringo's in this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is a proper creative product that actually has a Beatle reunion. Uh, uh, yeah. Just albeit one that isn't really at the heart of it. No. You know, it feels like it's it's the kind of thing where now I feel like nowadays you would don't you'd only let that happen if it was the point of the film or it was a bigger thing bigger part of the film yeah but Ringo just kind of seems to be in it and isn't even like the second most amount of screen time or the third most amount of screen time like he's Mm. he's a relatively small character in this yeah he's not really part of the story so much certainly not he's drumming in uh, Paul's bands you know in some of the sessions that are being played Mm. Uh, and there are sort of fantasy sequences in which yeah so Ringo spends a lot of time trying to get off with a journalist who has come to interview him. He's played by Barbara Bach, who is his wife in real life, which is just really charming in and of itself. Just it's like... charming of itself, but it's also where, where Ringo is using lines on his own, <laughs> on his own wife, okay? yeah. which, which is, is, is charming that she's that they've been cast in that way. Yeah. But he's a sleazy character. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like It's not like the, the relationship that evolves for the two of them I mean, it evolves. Even that is politely <laughs> putting it right. But he basically says, "Why don't you come to my house and listen yeah. to the tapes?" Right? He's very, <laughs> yeah, much, yeah. very, very quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to get you back to my place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the charming part sort of slips a bit for me <laughs> there when when yeah. he's he sees her and immediately is like, "I want to crack on with her." Yes. Yeah, and so there, there are bits in it as well where, um, and I forget whether this is happening in the actual story. Uh, which is in itself a story within a story, but let's leave that aside for right, yeah. uh, So is it happening within the actual story or is it happening in one of the fantasy sequences? Uh, so there are fantasy sequences in which um, uh, Paul, Paul and Linda and Ringo and Barbara are sort of off uh, in a sort of, I'm going to say it's sort of like Regency costume yeah. or Victorian or something like that. Yeah, um, it's sort of general period drama garb and sort of in, in, in a with a horse and carriage and all this kind of stuff, you know. Um, and there are bits where they seem to be going on double dates as well. And and actually, one of the things it raises is so Linda is in this and she is the keyboard player in his band and she has a, a few lines here and there. But I am not sure whether the character of Linda in this is Paul's wife in the story. I'm not sure. Yeah. If are they married in the story? Or is I don't. There... I don't. It, it doesn't explicitly say that they're married. Or, or but even they are a couple. I'm I think. Not sure. I, I think it's very much implied they are a couple. And I'm, there is. I'm not sure. You know. I... So so they talk about going for dinner and going for dinner with uh, Ringo and um, Barbara back. Right. And, and then it's interesting that they say that early on in the film, and obviously that evening, in quotation marks. Um, the dinner they have is basically like a double date picnic in their Regency costumes. Yeah. Um. So that. So that. I feel like there's a part of that 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 comes into it, and and I think there is probably a little bit of a. It would be really good to do a bit of a breakdown and proper analysis of that sequence uh, as a dream sequence because. Yeah, I, you can that's imagine what everyone wants to hear. Isn't it? Right. That's why. That's why you've tuned in. I say, folks, like, I say it'd be really good for someone else to do that. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I have yeah, no yeah. intention of doing no, that. Fine, fine. But it'll be really interesting to see if there are other elements in the film that play into that because I I do think this idea of them having dinner together is introduced in that sequence as well. There is a moment where he sees her come through, uh, all dressed in white on a white horse, yeah. and it's very much like she's like the angel of this sort of sort of weird sort of scenario right, kind of thing. Right. so i think it's implied that there is a uh like he, she's not just bandmate mm. um so I, I think i think it's implied but absolutely not explicitly stated whatsoever right yeah but yes so sorry going back to the beatles uh yeah, you know, uh, commercial angle of this film uh, and the idea that it can be sold as a bit of a beatles reunion and also importantly obviously that mccartney himself re-records the beatles songs for it Yes, yeah, uh, and uh, the, the scenes with Paul and Ringo where they have conversations. Yeah. So Ringo is great because he he's a good actor in it. Yeah. Uh, and and Paul is you know in in general has an, a very sort of detached air throughout the whole thing, and he's he, he's quite stiff in general, and, and so like what what 
what the finances were looking for was that that sort of like uh, the chemistry of sort of uh, you know sort of Beatle banter, you know, where they just sort of bounce off each other comically as they as they did in the previous films. There is no particular reason why they shouldn't in in this, right? Exactly. Um, yeah. Because we sort of t- talked before a bit about when you know, so look, when when Ringo has been in films, you know, does does he particularly struggle without the other Beatles, you know? And so, it, and it, yes and no to varying degrees. But Paul, who, like, in Help and A Hard Day's Night, is great. He's, re- he's re- you know, he's really really natural. You know, mm. he spoke, spoke before about, you know, he do, does a lot of good sort of, like, like close-up work and things like that. And you, and you don't think, oh, this guy's a great actor. But you, but you do think, oh, he's pretty capable, you know? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, so you could be forgiven for thinking, well, especially in his scenes with Ringo, like that, that kind of thing will just kind of like naturally click into place. And there are scenes in that South Bank show documentary with just him and Ringo on the set, like talking to the director, and they're just sort of mucking about and joking with each other. And that chemistry is there. Yeah. And then the camera turns on, and it's just gone. Yeah, yeah. It's just not. It's there. funny, isn't it? Yeah. And I, I think I think I think this very much scripted uh, humor. Yeah. Um, that doesn't translate at all. I think yeah. that. Um, I, I think I see shades in it sometimes in the anthology series where it feels like Paul trying to force um, this idea of a deep-rooted friendship with actually friends who have become quite estranged over time. Yeah. So if it wasn't for that South Bank show, I would say actually they're not that close anymore at this point. Right. It, and actually it's it's written in a way to imply that they are, but clearly there's no chemistry. Mm. But as you say in that South Bank show, you can see that chemistry is absolutely there. Yeah. I, I, but Ringo is great in the film there's there's a few bits where he has his throwaway moments and lines and stuff there's actually a really good bit um after there's an extended sequence in the film where they for some reason just play three songs in a row yeah as part of their rehearsal uh with nothing else happening at all you're literally just watching the band play three songs in a row and after the first song which i think is not such a bad boy mm-hmm. um you it's almost faint in the background but you can hear the camera's not on them. The camera's panned away somewhere. You can hear Paul turn around to Ringo and say, um, that was quite good, that. And Ringo's like, I know. About time you noticed. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, just really, it's just a really funny line. It's like, right, it's, right. It's just, and I kind of feel like that probably wasn't scripted. It's just giving, he's just giving a bit back, you know? Right, right, yeah. And, um, but, you know, that, uh, but that sort of uh, chatter just sort of always came very natural to them when it was the four of them. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure it comes very natural to them when it's just like Paul and Ringo having dinner. You know. Yes. Yeah. But there is something about turning a camera on Paul and saying act, uh, and I I think he is very self conscious and feeling the pressure of uh, the realization that I have to carry this whole thing. Now, um, if you think about the, the the sort of guy he is, he's very used to being. He likes being the leader of things. He likes being in charge of things. It's not nothing wrong with that. Um, he so in most of his creative endeavors, he's absolutely earned that right. Um, and again, it sort of comes back to that question of hubris we were talking about earlier, where uh, in he's gone into the medium of film and kind of assumed that he can approach it in in the same way and like, well, I'll I'll be the center of this thing, and that works because that's the, you know it's me. I'm used to being the center of things, but I think he's feeling quite exposed mm. by by the acting part of it in particular, um, and. There's, and I, I think the way that comes through is that um, it, it just gets rid of any of his sort of natural wit or energy because because he, he's naturally a very funny bloke. Like, yeah. you, like you hear him interviews, like like he's very witty and like he's a good sort of mimic and things like that. You know, he's very funny. And um, but yeah, all, all of a sudden when he, he is when <laughs> when he's acting funny, it's just incredibly stiff all of a sudden. Yeah. And I just think I just think he's feeling that pressure in a way that he probably hasn't done before. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think there's, I think there's definitely that is part of it. I think also, I feel like he's approaching this as a drama, right? And 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 that deliberately doesn't have, or or certainly consciously doesn't have, the same kind of zany humor that his previous movies have had. Yeah. Where where he can sort of, you know, I guess maybe like a silly sense of humor probably comes quite naturally to him, but. Yeah. But this idea of scripted jokes, the odd scripted joke in what is otherwise presented as a drama, is is sort of stiffens him a bit. But I think I think it's it's fascinating that it's fascinating that Ringo is in the film. Yeah, 
it's interesting that he's in the film as Paul McCartney's drummer, which yeah. isn't the case at all outside of the film. Yeah. So it's interesting that he, you know that there is that, that I guess they have agreed that on the, in this film present they they are presenting this idea that they're in a band together again. Mm. It's also interesting to me that the very first time you see Paul and Ringo on screen together uh, is when they're getting ready to perform a song. Ringo is basically saying, what are we going to do? And Paul's like, oh, it's the medley. And Ringo doesn't seem prepared for whatever that song is. Yeah. And just before they start playing, Paul says, no, 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 brushes. Mm. So immediately, Paul's first interaction with Ringo is to tell him how to drum. <laughs> His first intro is like, oh, yeah. So what I'm going to write is like yeah, the, the point when we fell out in 1968, yes. the worst we've ever fallen out, and Ringo walked out. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'll write a scene in which, in which I basically treat him like that again. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's just baffling to me. Uh, yeah. Rather than give, rather than give Ringo any kind of hero moment as a as his own for his own musical contribution to mm. uh, these songs, it's very much a poor show. Yeah, and, and I guess that's what I mean. It's fascinating to me that Ringo is in the film as his drummer in his band, but also that is his only function. He isn't giving a, a showy character yeah. at all. Um, he is Paul's drummer, yeah. not Ringo Starr. Yeah, you know, it's just it's an interesting choice. Like in some ways, I'm surprised that Ringo agreed to to do it. Yeah, I suppose because R- Ringo could be playing Harry, right? You know, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that would kind of make sense as a role. Like he's an earthy guy and he's been in prison and stuff like yes. that. Yeah, would actually. So I mean, Harry obviously he's missing for a lot of the film, but like you see him a fair bit in flashback, and Definitely. there are fantasy sequences in which he's sort of uh, being pursued across moors, uh, ch- you know, chased by police dogs uh, holding the tapes and things yeah. like that. And you're never quite sure whether that's in Paul's head. It, I mean, it definitely is. You realise that afterwards it obviously is, right? Well, yeah. So, sorry, yeah. but uh, So you, you realise afterwards because of the context, because you, you don't know where Harry is and, mm. and this is sort of suggesting where he is. So, it, so yeah, it, it is flagged that it is a fantasy of some kind. But also, it, in what context is Paul imagining this? Um, because he's because Harry is also in these sequences of uh sort of Victorian streets, sort of yes. Jack, Jack the Ripper kind of thing, mm. where Harry's like running with the um with the uh, with the tapes, which are now sort of glowing blue, like the Tesseract in the Avengers film. <laughs> yes, for some reason, and like yeah. uh, and um. But anyway, yeah, I mean, so so Harry is like I say missing a lot, but he is probably a big enough role and. A crucial role that R- Ringo could have played that, mm. you know, and actually, yeah, it's it, it's interesting that they, he, that they didn't go down that route because it would it would be a greater tribute to the fact that like, well, it, you know, we're, we're in this film together again, and we're both Beatles, um, but also this guy is is the best actor out of the Beatles, and like I'm acknowledging that by giving him like a proper part, yeah, you know? I, and I I do feel like Paul is more interested in getting the group dynamic right mm. then he is about getting the characters in the film right yeah you know uh and it, it's actually it's i mean we should talk about it as well so again it's very interesting that for this film paul decides to re-record new versions of some of his old beatles songs and yeah. some of his uh wings and the solo songs as well but but i think a real standout element of this movie is that he's re-recording yesterday for no one uh eleanor rigby was the other one i was thinking of um and there's other versions of long and winding road as well isn't there and obviously good day sunshine you said uh yes that's right i think those are the ones um but it's also interesting that um or am i right in thinking this or am i wrong like ringo doesn't play the drums on any of those songs i yeah i don't think so um he does he play a bit on no he plays on wanderlust yeah, he? so so um, the 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 idea of getting the brushes was for Ringo to brushes for yesterday, right? Yeah, um, but he actually doesn't actually get his sticks out until Paul goes into Wanderlust. I think I'm not sure. I forget the way it goes. Because I think yeah. that's I, I think I, I think that's right because I don't think there are any actual proper drumming happening in yesterday. But I I could be wrong. Could be misremembering. But in the South Bank show, Paul talks specifically about this as well, and where um, Melvin Bragg asks him whether he thinks it's sacrilege to be re-recording the Beatles songs and whether fans will think that way. And he says he doesn't think so. He says, they're my songs. You know, I can do them what I like. But yeah. Ringo, he he makes the point of saying that Ringo has the opposite stance. He says, I won't re-record 
these songs I did drumming on it it was already great so I'm not going to do it again yeah um, which is so that's interesting so I wonder if there was you know at what point was that sort of discussion had how far was the idea explored where they might actually re-record Beatles songs together again yeah. properly and where it fell apart or what it just, why they decided not to do that yeah yeah but it, so I think there was a point and I presume it didn't get very far where it was at least mooted that George would be in the film as well George Harrison oh, right. Uh, and I, I read somewhere that you know that, that he said no, and that was that. But I think so. It sounds like it got as far as him at least being asked, even if informally, yeah. that he'd want to be in it. There's an interview with George where he's talk talking about what do you think of Give My Regards to Broad Street, you know, and he you know, he, and he's not a fan, but also says I I don't think he should have re-recorded Beatles songs. That's interesting. I think yeah. he should leave him alone in general. Now, like you know, he, he and Paul not on particularly good terms. In, in the 80s or even in the 90s, really. Yeah. But, um, you can only imagine how much fun George would have had in a Paul McCartney ego film, you know, because <laughs> that's what this film is, right? And so, right, right. Like yeah. having George play second fiddle to a, a movie where it's all about Paul, just, I don't think that, I don't think he's in that place no, at this time. No, probably not. And yeah, you can't, I mean, you know, the, I mean, the Beatle who comes. Uh, comes out of this film the best is George by, yeah, by absolutely <laughs> by by virtue of his distance from it <laughs> right by far um, <laughs> but I should say uh, so the re- the reason I had to uh, quantify it by saying George Harrison is that George Martin is in the film yes as well. that's right yes um, and he is uh, acting the part of uh, the, I'm not sure if he's named as George Martin but he's the producer on some songs and you know he's in the control room and he's great he's very he's very yeah. natural i think like he doesn't have loads to do or anything but he is just uh, just being quite natural and incredibly handsome as well yes. like yeah, yeah, yeah. like at that stage of his life i think he's probably he's got his studio out in montserrat by this point so he's just like very suntanned so he would be he was 60 around 60 at this yeah, time yeah yeah or six, 61 62 i think yeah yeah um but yeah, yeah that is that is uh, interesting i there there's lots of shots of him during that uh, medley because what the film decides to do at that point, as Paul is playing uh, those those songs, is use it as an excuse to provide us a bit of a montage of what happens in the control room. Right. Which has no relevance to or, or bearing on the plot at all. Like I Normally, in any other film, if there's a musical interlude or something and there is a montage to be had, it is something that then propels that plot forward. You see other characters do other things and by the time the song's end we are in a different situation to where we were in before those songs started yeah but this isn't this is we're going to show you uh what the engineers are doing whilst paul is recording this in a sort of a montage way yeah because we can't just have the camera showing paul's face the entire time right this is just an odd choice yeah uh, to do that i mean there is an argument as well you know that there's a reading of this film where you take at face value that everything that happens in it is in some way a fantasy of Paul's, yeah. including having Ringo back in his band as his drummer. Yeah, that's true. You know, like yeah. there, there is, there's, there's, you could give Paul the benefit of the doubt or the film the benefit of the doubt and mm. saying that that is part of the reason for Ringo's casting in, in the movie and yeah. uh, that's why he's there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you have to at least <laughs> allow for the idea that some of this was deliberate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sure. Yes. <laughs> you know, the, the, some some of these were like actual creative choices that he meant, rather than just sort of went uh, went wrong in some way. Um, so yeah, no, that's you know what it's a it's a nice thought you've had. Yeah. It, oh, a, thanks. It's, it, no, but it's a really nice thought that um, that actually he's thinking. Oh, you know, I love being in a band with Ringo. Yeah. And that's the fantasy that he's having in the film. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's a nice way of thinking about. It. I mean, it's very charitable, but yes, it is. It is <laughs> yeah, charitable is the right word. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, and I, I wonder as we talk more uh, about this that um, uh, whether other things could be argued charitably in that same way if yeah. we if we saw it through a, a bit of a nicer lens and and took it at that face value. <laughs> the, the other thing to uh, I was thinking about when watching paul re like perform again the beatles songs was i wonder why he chose these ones in particular yeah uh, and and again i know we keep referring to it and uh, i cannot stress enough again that everyone listening to this should watch the 
the South Bank episode on YouTube yeah. about the making of this because it is really, really genuinely interesting. But Paul is asked uh, a kind of a similar question, and he basically says that the reasons he the reason he chose these songs were because they were ones that he were enjoying playing at the time. Um, but also he points out that there, you know, a lot of the songs that are being remembered. Uh, a lot of the Beatles songs that people remember are the Sherry ones. I think he calls out Strawberry Fields Forever and Sgt. Pepper's at the time as yeah. being milestones in the Beatles career. Yeah. Whereas a song like For No One, um, he calls it a B-side. Yeah. Um, and, and he said these are the songs that people forget about, but actually it's a nice melody. And he talks really fondly actually about rediscovering uh, these songs from their, the early parts of their career and stuff. And it's really nice hearing him talk about having recently rediscovered those songs and what they mean to him and how much he, he uh, how highly he thinks of them now. Yeah. Um, now that the dust has settled a lot on the, the negative feelings associated with some of them. But it's interesting that he calls it out and says that, you know, this is him showcasing a song that people may not remember. But then the others he chose is, that he chose to do are Yesterday and mm. Eleanor Rigby. Yeah. Um, and, Famously obscure B sides. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and actually, I I think what's more likely to be the case is he has chosen songs that are very much his songs. Yeah, they are McCartney songs within the Beatles catalogue. Yeah, that he can sing and perform, and and I guess feel like they are uh, songs that he owns in a way. Yeah, so I suppose that there's a couple of different ways to look at that. Um, w- one is the the obvious reading is. Um, yeah, th- those were originally um, k- kind of like McCartney solo songs almost. So Yesterday was the first song that only one Beatle uh, performed on. I think Eleanor Rigby also, he's the only only Beatle performing on it. Uh, for no one, I'm not sure, but I think uh, but it, it's it, mainly him and, uh, and yeah, a piano and an orchestra. So it, they're songs of which he probably feels he has ownership already. And so you can kind of interpret that as sort of a bit of ego mainly uh, maybe or another reading of it is that John Lennon only died uh, you know sort of uh, th- two or three years ago when this is being shot and when he's deciding which songs to use it like Im- imagine the reaction if he had taken Lennon McCartney songs that were more sort of Lennon based or had more yeah. Lennon in them if you like um and and redone them. I think that would have gone down a lot worse. Absolutely, yeah. I see what you mean. In, in terms of re-recording them, which he was apparently very keen to do for this film, yeah. Um, and and was keen to to re-record everything live as it was being filmed, which meant automatically meant a re-recording of of, of these songs. Yeah. I guess you're right. Steering clear of more Lennony songs uh, makes sense. Yeah, because I mean, he had he started playing being for the benefit of Mr. Kite in his live set uh, back in, well, I saw him do it in 2015. I think he, I think he started doing it around then. And he got a bit of uh, stick for that, not loads, wow. yeah. uh, but a bit of like, hey, that's a John song. What are you doing with it? You know, and, you know, he quite reasonably said, well, it's a Lennon McCartney song. Mm-hmm. And and yes, it was mainly John's. I'm kind of playing it as a tribute to him, just like he plays something, something. as a tribute to George. Exactly, yeah. You know? So like, he's certainly playing that in the right spirit. Um, not that there would be a wrong spirit in which to play it, but you know what I mean. Um, it, it, but it's interesting that uh, sort of Lennon fans, even in sort of 2015, were kind of thinking of that as maybe a bit of a land grab. Yeah, wow. And so, you know, th- 30 years before that, if he'd been re-recording more sort of Lennon-based songs, or even even the ones where they're sort of much more, you know, sort of generally known to be 50-50 um uh, compositions yeah yeah i think it has to be careful there i mean he does again he talks about in the south bank show that they were considering for a while having hey jude in the film right and again that is very obviously a macca song yeah so yeah you're right i think it's very carefully chosen to 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 be songs that that he can directly claim yeah and i think also that they are songs the ones he goes for are ones where an orchestra can be put around them, or mm. like was was put around them in the original, in most cases, or you know, or like at least there were some, you know, string or wind instruments. Yes, yeah. Um, so they lend themselves to the score more. Yeah, they lend themselves to the score. So he talks in that documentary about, you know, ha- having scored this film, which, um, and they're talking about this being sort of the first time he scored an entire film. They're sort of discounting the family way. 
Uh, I think probably because, it, you know, whether, whether it's the official version or not, I think his main contribution to that was to sort of, he wrote the sort of motif right. and that George Martin kind of extrapolated it into the score. Yeah, sure. Um, Whereas this is very much him scoring the whole, whole thing and he, he talks yeah. again at length. And the interesting thing about the Eleanor Rigby uh, version in this film is that that then segues into uh, an eight or nine minute score based on Eleanor Rigby mm. that plays over the Regency dream sequence that we spoke about earlier. Now, we we should dig into that dream sequence a, a little bit. Mm. Not not in an analytical way, which I don't think either of us are qualified to do. Um, but I will say, say straight off the bat that um, I think the score that he produces there is fantastic. Yeah. Like the, the, you know, having those motifs come through and and it's very, very sophisticated in a way that surprises me, that, that, that still surprises me about McCartney, even though I know how talented he is in that area. But also in a film where the the, the showier uh, musical contributions he makes are like slap bass. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. so to, to, for him to have done like the pop, um, had the pop sensibility side of the film covered, but also then produced his amazing scores with a whole range of instruments at one point it um it uh it transitions into this um romantic feel spanish guitar solo um go, comes back into this dramatic orchestral piece there's also um like a choir like a choral part that starts singing some of the lyric refrains from the song but out of sequence yeah so there's the odd line here and there and stuff um and it all is quite haunting um mm. it is very 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 effective it is a bit of a shame that it is over that dream sequence which yes. is nuts <laughs> <laughs> it is yeah so let, let me like in terms of the the, the dream sequences oh i have no I mean, if you're going to ask me for an interpretation or or even an next even um to talk through what happens i couldn't tell you <laughs> but i mean we can try I'm not going to try and, and explain what actually happens in the dream sequences. Uh, you know, I think the audience, um, w- <laughs> like if you're listening to this podcast um, and you haven't seen Give My Regards to Broad Street, please go and watch it. Um, it is, um, I was about to say fantastic there. And I suppose that is, uh, yeah. that's, that's, that's one. Uh, that's tr- in the truest sense. <laughs> in the truest <laughs> sense, yeah. Um, but I I think an interesting thing about those dream sequences is that they they all seem to fit a, a dramatic archetype or a generic archetype of some kind. So I don't know if you remember when we were talking about Magical Mystery Tour and we were talking about there are bits in there where you can tell that if, if you accept that Paul McCartney is mainly the director of Magical Mystery Tour, that he has watched... Uh, like action films with chase sequences in yes them. yes i know what you mean yeah and he's watched like french m- melodrama you know uh, melodrama romances you know the bit yeah. on the beach yes uh, that's a bit um, i think of yeah because that's very effectively done right and um I, I don't know how sort of like like cine literate he is in general but it certainly suggests someone who has observed tropes and or or, or genres and knows how to repeat them or has a desire to repeat them in some way so you think of uh, so part of the fancy sequence is the, uh, the the costume drama, and then there's also the sort of uh, uh, Victorian scenes that seem to be sort of uh, uh, you know Jack, Jack the Ripper that kind of thing, mm. and uh, and things like uh, the lighting and the way that is done in there. It's obviously not down to him. You know, there's a director and um you know and and God knows how many crew working on it, but um, if if you accept that this is Paul McCartney's creative vision, um. It's interesting that he seems to he, he seems to sort of observe these things and just want to sort of like oh I'm making a film I'll I'll drop in these bits like I've seen films in which it, it, this it, it, that look like this or this kind of thing happens so I'll, mm. I'll you know I'll drop these bits in that's what films are yeah, and, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, that's kind, yeah. I think that's kind of and and I think maybe that gets gets us slightly closer to how he thinks about projects like this yeah you know? i think that makes sense i think that there's i actually think there's a lot of stuff going on in that dream sequence that that deserves some credit yeah i think knowing knowing that it is uh explicitly a dream sequence in the film 
as opposed to the other sort of fantasy sequences where you're not quite sure or or are a little bit more grounded. Mm. This is one that plays like a dream. Yeah. And it's some of the, I mean, for 1984, some of the transitions that take place in that sequence. So you see McCartney in his Regency outfit with, you know, long sideburns and quaffed hair and stuff. He sees a horse and carriage go past and it's got uh, some of the sort of side characters in. It cuts back to him looking at it again and then this time when you go back to the horse and carriage he's in the horse and carriage and and it follows him from that point mm. uh, in the horse and carriage even when they bring out the the MacGuffin the the tapes uh, the master tapes and it's glowing blue that has some kind of symbolic reference in, in the in the dream sequence in a way that dream sequences have like there's that's a creative decision to present the master tapes in that way within yeah. the context of this dream yeah as opposed to just someone showing the already relatively bright blue plastic case right yeah and there was there were moments in that that kind of remind me of things like you know like that him looking at the horse carriage and then seeing himself there is it's almost reminiscent a little bit of the end of um 2001 space odyssey where you see dave bowman uh, looking at himself in the bed, and then the next thing you know, you know, at, at the end after the Stargate sequence, and then and then you see it from his point of view in the bed, and there's, yeah. you know, there are artistic choices that are made in in that in that whole uh, set piece that I do think do a good job of being unsettling enough, yeah, in a way that the film is trying to be at that point. Yeah, I think the problem is is that it's also trying to convey plot elements that just come across as complete nonsense <laughs> when when it's just mixing genres it's it's mixing different elements of the film previously to now mm. like you say there's like a jack the ripper style element there's these the, the the corporate business type people at the end standing on the steps bearing over um harry's stabbed body uh <laughs> on the steps of some sort of government town hall kind of building mm. um, when, when really all he's done is potentially maybe stolen some master tapes <laughs> and suddenly it's like, you know, it's a, it's a Victorian murder case. Yeah. So I, it's, it's absolutely baffling to me that the whole sequence is, is baffling. And what really makes it worse for me is that again, constantly referring back to this South Bank show, but when, when Paul says in that documentary, uh, oh, we got given you know all of this footage back, and I was like, oh, eight minutes. Oh, you're telling me I've got to score eight minutes, right? Okay, fine. Like he's really put out by it. <laughs> like it was a really important eight minutes that couldn't be edited down to like thirty seconds if they wanted to, because because really, really, like it is all extraneous stuff. There was no need yeah. for for that whole sequence to be as long as it is, yeah, or you know, or to even be in the film at all. So yeah, it, it's this. Uh, undue importance as well placed on that sequence in the film because it feels like a climactic sequence in the film yeah. without actually really doing anything climactic for the plot or uh, uh, the rest of the narrative. But I suppose like what it, it, what is happening in that dream sequence is, is of course a dream within a dream. You know, this yes, is, of uh, course, yeah, yeah, going deep. Um, this is Inception. It is Inception, and uh, and it's. I mean, it's funny you should mention that <laughs> because if you think of. Um, the fact that in, well, I suppose what's happening in those is that Paul is is uh, ha- having he is having a fancy or a daydream of some kind about you know like he he and his wife and Ringo and his wife are, are off like having a picnic in Regency costume. Um, but what keeps on breaking through is the sort of glowing uh, like the, the tape box, like the stolen tapes, yeah. and it's almost like his subconscious is giving him clues as to where these tapes might be. Mm. Um, so, the, and bits of that are going on in Inception, you know, in fact, yes, I, yeah. it's probably safe to say that this entire, uh, in, <laughs> in, 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 would there have been Inception without giving my regards to Broad Street? Who can Who's say? Who's to say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, that seems to be what it is. His subconscious is giving him clues, you know, mm. and then, you know, to, towards the end, um, you know, <laughs> When he, when Paul uh, kind of uh, f- figures out, or sort of, it, or what what sparks Paul off to sort of finally figure out what has happened to these tapes, um, and again, you know, sort of about ge- sort of generic tropes that actually the, the the main genre that the thing is is a sort of mystery or a who done it, mm. um, or a 
what 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 done it or what happened or uh, <laughs> what happened <laughs> what ha- <laughs> that's, that's not a thing is it what sort of film is it it's it's a, it's a what, what happened classic what happened right okay it's, it's sort of most films isn't it <laughs> but um so he uh you know there is a mystery to be solved you know and paul is the detective you know uh, he does no detective work whatsoever mm-hmm. until the sort of last 15 minutes or so when he kind of starts thinking about it a bit he goes off to the old justice pub and uh he goes and sees the landlord there and asks the land uh, the landlord was harry in the other night and yeah. so like this scene is really interesting because so uh, this guy uh, this landlord is called it's called jim um and he's played by ralph richardson who is a sort of like old much venerated uh, british actor this was the last thing he ever appeared in he died quite soon after filming the scenes mm. i think i'm not sure he he even lived to see the film's release uh, which might be might have been a mercy yeah. to be honest. <laughs> uh, but um i i find it really interesting that this this guy who has had you know this sort of obviously storied career and um it, the last thing he does is to be in a scene with an obvious non-actor and and the scene is really only sort of half written as well and you think well what is an actor like ralph richardson thinking about at the time because he's great he's doing really well in it yeah you know and so it's another one of these scenes where just bits in it that don't go anywhere so like jim says would you like a cup of tea and paul says no i'm all right like you know i'm not gonna be here long and then they talk a bit and then jim says again you sure you don't want a cup of tea and paul goes oh oh, yeah okay actually yeah i will and like (laughs) if you're going to do something like that there needs to be some significance to it. Like there needs to be like a, a reason why yeah. he, he like he's changed his mind, right? And that needs to convince you of something that Paul uh, Paul's thinking has shifted at some point in the scene, and he now thinks, yes, actually, I will stay and have a cup of tea because I think this is going somewhere or, or whatever. Yeah, but, but there's agree, yeah. there's none of that at all, and and it's also that usually in terms of dramatic structure, this character would be the, the sort of wise old sage who gives Paul some advice. Mm. And he kind of does give him some advice in it. Paul just kind of ignores it. <laughs> and but the, but the point, I feel like that's a, also a recurring motif for the production <laughs> of this whole film, to be honest with you. Yeah, true. <laughs> um, and, um, but yeah, he, 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 he should be sort of giving him advice, which Paul then goes... Ah, right. You know, and that gives him an idea, and yes. it sparks off the third act. Yes, that, that's yeah, like, completely dr- agree. Yeah, dramatically, that, that is how a construct construct like this usually works. You know? Yeah, and it happens a lot with sort of wise old sage characters. Yeah, you know, who sort of like suddenly change the protagonist's mind, make them think in a different way, and now they're off towards like solving the crime or whatever it is. Um, but basically, like uh, Paul establishes that Harry was in the pub. And I think also establishes that he has a, a blue box with him. Yeah. But then just doesn't press any further. <laughs> no. like he's, he, he's there specifically to find out what happened to Harry and this blue box of tapes. And he finds out there was a blue box and then just sort of leaves it at that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But and, they, and then but, just leaves. But they, but they get into very quickly this sort of weird quoting, uh, almost Shakespearean quotes yeah. with each other. Oh, and um, Jim the landlord starts saying like, you know, do you want me to read? He, he basically, he quotes leisure. What is this life? If you look okay, if you have no time to stop, stand and stare. Yeah. And then says, I write poetry. Do you want to read some of my poetry? Again, like all of it, just yeah. needless. Yeah. And Paul goes, oh, no, I'm all right. Yeah. Like, oh, okay. It, it's, it's so, and so it, there seems to be a bit in it where, where, where like the character of Paul should be a, a, arriving at some sort of self-realization through this interaction. So, like, you know, Jim says to him, you know, like, like, you're always running around. Like, if you didn't run around so much, you might get a better view of the world, is what he yes. says to him. Which, by the way, reminded me of, like, have you ever heard the story of uh, Liam Gallagher meeting Paul backstage at the Royal Albert Hall? No. Where, like, um, um, uh, <laughs> and Paul says to him, uh, you're, always, you're always in such a rush. Sit down, sit down. And he, and he says to Liam, uh, do you want a margarita? And Liam says, no, it's all right. I ate before I left. <laughs> Paul says, "I meant a drink, you daft prick." <laughs> anyway, but like, I liked the fact Amazing. that like, it, it reminded me of that. Like, those roles were reversed, of yeah, someone yeah. saying to Paul, "Like, you're always rushing around. Take your time." But the character of Paul like doesn't heed this advice. 
uh, at all, or at least he doesn't seem to take it in. He just sort of goes. It, it's such a good example of like how these scenes are written, where it, it would take no work at all to sharpen that scene up. No, absolutely, yeah, at you're all, right, because yeah. like it, it, all of the, its building blocks are there. And again, it kind of demonstrates, I think, that Paul McCartney has watched films in which the wise old sage talks to the protagonist, sends him off in another direction. But he's kind of only digested half of it. He's sort of digested yeah. the surface level of it. And he's just kind of like stuck it in a film. Yes. Yeah. And it would have been so easy, you know, just to, you know, pr- presumably, you know, if he let someone else have a, have a look at the script, maybe someone who'd written a script. Before, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, they would have said, oh, okay, actually, if you tighten this up a bit and if you make him say this, that will send Paul off and then the third act can kick off, that yeah. kind of thing, you know. But because it, what actually happens at that point, because that leads directly into the actual last part of the film, yeah. where Paul finds Harry. Mm. And what actually happens is he drives around a bit <laughs> and just remembers for the first time that day yeah. that Harry said he was going to Broad Street. Yeah, it was the last thing and, he said to him. Yes. Before, before like, you know, the he, last time he saw Harry, that's what he said. Is it, so, obviously, if you were trying to retrace someone's steps, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's where you start. Yeah. Um, it, this is, by the way, one possibly one of the um, best slash worst moments in the film where Paul remembers this. And, like, I haven't seen anyone remember something so visibly before like, because he <laughs> literally looks up at the sky and loudly clicks his fingers yeah, yeah, like yeah, you yeah. do like if you're really making a show of the fact you just remembered something you know like oh you yeah. know like really like that's what i'm doing right reverse right yeah. right right it um, re- reminds me a bit of um i don't know if like if you if you've like narrowly missed a bus or a train. Yes. And um, people pe- people have seen you like not quite make it, and yeah. they're looking. At, they're on the train and they're looking at you. And I don't know about you, but I often feel like I have to sort of perform ever so slightly. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like there's a sort of performative like oh, just missed it, Ugh, like to show that I'm not too annoyed or whatever. Lee, Lee Evans used to have this thing where it's like um, you know when you're walking down the street and you realise that you've forgotten something, you have to go around, but you can't just turn around because people think you're crazy. Yeah. So whenever you do it, you have to be like, oh, I forgot my briefcase. And yeah, like, yeah, you have to be really, <laughs> really performative. Yeah, it's very yeah. much like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, even though he's in the car by himself driving it so so um so he does that visibly uh remembers that um harry said he was going to broad street so then finally decides to check out broad street yeah this is where uh no more lonely nights kicks in so what we basically get is lots of somber shots of a lonely single paul mccartney walking around a very very empty deserted london station yeah uh until he sits down does actually what i think is a uh, very effective and probably uh, Paul's best piece of acting in the whole film, a pretty decent double take when he actually spots the uh, master tapes on the bench next to him. Yeah, which have been on a bench on yep. a train platform for about 24 hours so let's dig in. So let's dig into this, okay. right? Because, <laughs> because then what he does is he hears Harry crying help yep. um, and he discovers Harry locked in a sort of janitor's building. room or whatever, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. He um, <laughs> to say kicks the door down is <laughs> is generous because he kind of lightly taps it with his foot yeah, and it yeah, swings yeah. wide open. Yeah, only for Harry to be like, "Oh, it locks on the outside. <laughs> I've been stuck in here uh, all night and all morning, and yeah. then I fell asleep. And it's cold and it's dark, and I yeah. thought this was a toilet." Yeah, um, giving eight excuses in one go, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then they just fall about laughing, and all is forgiven, and the day is saved. Not that Paul is annoyed that um, Harry has taken his master tapes to the station and needing to go to the toilet has decided to leave those abandoned on a bench yeah, in yeah. order to then go and try and find a toilet and then get locked on it. Yeah, the, the master tapes of the album that has mm. um, like four times more uh, pre- <laughs> pre- pre-sales than any other album yes. in history. So even yeah. if Harry was correct and had found a toilet... He had still very much put those master tapes at risk. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I, that is enough for me for Paul to n- fire him. You know, <laughs> like it, it just is out of it, negligence, right? It's, rather it's than sort of, any kind of criminal yeah, intent. I, I suppose, like to be fair, like you know, everyone else in the film has been saying, "Oh no, we think he's probably a crook. He's probably stolen them." 
Um, he's not. He's just an idiot. R- right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. But it, like exceptionally negative. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes. like, like in a way that 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 it, in a way just kind of vindicates everyone else. Not thinking he's a crook, but yeah. certainly thinking this guy should not work. For yes, you. exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. He's really That's irresponsible. I mean. when, when I said <laughs> when I said he was a criminal and a thief, what I actually meant was that he was just dodgy, but dodgy in a different way. Dodgy in a way that meant he's inept. <laughs> yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's a it's a bizarre bizarre ending. Then he phones up uh, Linda um, and says, "Look, guess what I found? I found the tape." Linda, who by the way is in a very luxurious drawing room with Ringo and Barbara back, they immediately start uh, popping champagne and stuff like that because they are very much of a sort of mm. rich elite class at this point in the film for some reason. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I mean, so but we should point out the order of events. So, by the way, what is what is happening is that uh, the the reason they need these master tapes so badly is that um, if they don't yes. get them back in time, I suppose we could be forgiven for sort of not not mentioning this, even though it's the sort of main driving tension of the entire thing, because you, it's not particularly tense. Because you use two words there that don't exist: driving and tension. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they don't. They really don't apply to the situation <laughs> really not at, all. at all. But uh, but what's happening is is almost like a. A uh, similar scenario to like the end of Brewster's Millions, where like this thing has to happen by midnight. At at the stroke of midnight, yeah. uh, Paul's company will be uh, signed over um, to Rathbone Industries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Mister Rath, um, <laughs> who uh, wears sunglasses and is therefore evil. Yeah. And his driver slash minder is played by Frank Burnside from The Bill. Oh, is he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chris- <laughs> oh, Christopher yes. Ellison. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember thinking that. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, but what what's happening there is that so at this point it is about five to midnight. Mm-hmm. Um, Paul's company will be in ruins. Like <laughs> I think, like financially, he will be ruined by this. Yes. Yeah. If if in like in not five that there's minutes, really been any sense of that peril at all. No, no, no. <laughs> no. He doesn't come across as a man, as a, as a man in peril. No. Like, <laughs> no. It, it, once he discovers the tapes, he and Harry sort of like run down the uh, the station steps, having a bit of a laugh. Paul like chucks the tapes to Harry, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in, in a way to hey, hey, here we go, catch, you know, yeah. like it's a big laugh. And so they haven't. Um, obviously, there are no mobile phones, but like the first thing you do is call the office and say, hold everything, don't sign that contract. I've got the tapes. He doesn't do that. He calls his wife. Yeah. Who you know, and tells her, and then does he say to her, "Oh, can you tell the office?" Please? Yes, exactly. Forward it on, right? And yeah. she, and she, she's like, "All right, yeah, but uh, I mean, uh, me and Ringo will just get drunk for a bit first. <laughs> <laughs> then maybe, then maybe we'll give him a ring." You know? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's just, it, but it, it, that whole thing is, it, it just points to that the, the, uh, there is a lack of urgency about the entire thing. Yeah. Um, I suppose that those stake, the stakes I described there, are, are sort of. Um, uh, implied ones, really, that th- this is going to ruin him financially. Yes, you sort of have to piece this together it. yourself. And I suppose, like, th- there are people saying what is going to happen, but th- th- that is not sort of uh, dramatically forced through in any sense. You're no. not aware of how serious this is going to be, really. And, and, and I think one of the things—I mean, I think that's part of it. But the 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 sense of the stakes involved uh, aren't apparent at all in the film. But it's almost a doubly inadequate ending because. The, the actual resolution comes with this sense of cool god what am i like eh oh i accidentally got trapped in a cupboard that was the whole thing <laughs> yeah. and it was just this sense of like um oh oh it's just a bit of silly nothing really matters did it really you know yeah. it's just you know just this uh playful sense of silliness uh that caused the whole thing and all is forgiven and all is well yeah so if there were any sense of stakes then that would undermine them but as it is, it undermines nothing to begin with, and it just ends up feeling like it's um, uh, all been a waste of time. Which is, <laughs> to be fair, <laughs> bang on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, true. You know, and I mean, if the film was a waste of time, then recording a podcast about the film <laughs> for an hour and a half. I mean, what does this say about us? <laughs> this is now probably a good time to say. Do you agree? Have we wasted our life? Have you watched a film and feel like you've wasted your life? Uh, we'd love to know. Please get in touch with us on all the usual social media platforms. We are at Beatles Films Pod. We'd love to hear from you if you've seen the film and if there are any redeeming qualities at all that you think we may have missed 
or if you just want to chime in with more rinsing <laughs> of <laughs> of the movie uh, and any other points we may have overlooked. Also, while I have you, why not leave us a review? If you've enjoyed listening to this episode or listened to any other episodes and enjoyed those, it would be great if you could write us a review or even leave us a five-star rating on your podcast listening platform of choice. That would be very much appreciated. Otherwise, we're back now, so we will see you again next week for another episode. And until then, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.